Um, last week, um, Pastor Dan started a series called Devoted. And if you uh, weren't here to hear his message, a fan or a follower, can I just encourage you to go onto the website and listen to it or watch it? I, I just believe it was a pivotal message for, for all of us. And it stirred me and challenged me. But, but Dan, one of the things that you um, showed a picture, or no, you told the story of how you love a Brazilian steakhouse. Well, I want to show you a picture of our favorite Brazilian steakhouse. This one is actually in Nairobi, Kenya, and that is a a leg of ostrich. I know. Um, Next week, my favorite preacher in the whole world, my handsome hubby, will be sharing uh, the message next week. So I, can I just encourage you, we should do this every week. But there's somebody in your sphere of influence that doesn't go to church, that's just waiting for an invitation. Why not bring them next week? Why not say, why don't you come with me? What's the worst that they can say? No. But they may say yes, and it may be the thing that changes their life. I believe none of us are here by accident. And I believe that Sundays are supposed to make a difference in our Monday. About eight years ago, I tore my rotator cuff and had to have surgery to repair it. And if you've ever had that done, you know that's just the beginning. There's a grueling series of physical therapy. And I'll never forget what my physical therapist said to me. He said, it makes no difference what you do in the hour that you're here with me in physical therapy. What makes the difference, how you'll regain your mobility, is what you do outside of this hour. We get deposited in on Sunday. We get filled up because then we get to go out on Monday and we get to walk that out, what God's deposited in us. Do you know what else happens on Sunday? Maybe this happens to you. I don't know. My phone tells me how much I've been on social media or scrolling through my phone all week. Anybody else? Does your phone do that? I know. I I wish I didn't look. Sometimes I look at that and I'm like, Lord, help me. Really? That can't be right. I can't have spent that much time scrolling through my phone. Did you know the average North American spends two hours and 23 minutes a day on social media? Now, that's an average. Some of us, it's a whole lot more. Some of us, it's a whole lot less. But just over five billion with a B people use social media worldwide. And 266 million of those just started using it last year. And according to the World Health Organization, the average global lifespan is 73.4 years. And suppose we assume that some people start using social media as early as 10. Help us, Jesus, right? (laughs) That means the average person will spend a total of 3.4 million minutes using social media in their lifetime. Just a couple years ago, there was a study of college students in Pennsylvania, and they took two groups of students, and they said to the one group, they said, we want you to limit your social media time to 30 minutes a day, because they knew they couldn't do zero, but they said 30 minutes a day. To the other group, they said, just continue as normal, but each day, write down your feelings at the end of that day. At the end of that three-week trial, those in the experimental group, those who had limited their time to 30 minutes, they saw an incredible drop in levels of loneliness and depressive symptoms with the largest change happening in those that said, I was depressed before I started this, but just limiting my social media has incredibly improved my symptoms. Now, how could systems that were designed to bring us closer to our friends and family be bad for our mental health? Kerry Newoff says an interesting quote. He says, the paradox of our age is that we've never been more connected as a culture and we've never felt more alone. Now, if I were to take a poll this morning and ask us, and I'm not going to, but ask us to raise our hands if in this last week, You felt lonely, isolated, depressed. My guess is there's a lot of us that would raise our hand and say, yeah, that's that's me. I've felt that this last week. Now, I'm not here this morning to say um, 
social media is evil and we should all delete our accounts and stop using it. It's simply a tool. But the problem is we've used this tool as a poor substitute for real connection. And that's what we're going to dive in today. What in this series of Devoted, what does it look like to be devoted to community? What is biblical community? We throw around that word, but do we really know what it is? Biblical community, this will be our working definition for this, is doing life together in such a way that it accurately reflects the love of God to a watching world. Because there is a watching world and they're saying, is there anything different about those people that call themselves Jesus followers? Is there anything different? Is there, is there something I'm looking for? We're going to look at a passage of scripture in Acts chapter 2. But before we go to those verses, I want to give us a, a backdrop of what was happening. So we know the disciples had been following Jesus for three years. And they'd seen him do amazing things. They'd seen him raise the dead. They'd seen him heal the blind and, and the deaf and, and touch those with leprosy. They'd seen him walk on water and, and to feed thousands of people. And they thought, finally, here is the answer to all the oppression, all our problems, all that we've been experiencing. He is going to overthrow the government. And then he was crucified. They didn't know when he was crucified, even though he told them, they didn't know that he was going to be raised from the dead. And three days later, he raises from the dead. In scripture accounts, he appeared to them. Actually, did you know for 40 days after the resurrection, he appeared to them? So they're thinking, okay, now he is going to reestablish Israel. He's going to be the answer to all of our problems. And when he raised from the dead, he's going to fix this government. That's what they thought. And he said, no, 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 you, you don't understand. I have to go, but it's better for you if I go because the Father's going to send you a gift that's going to blow your mind. So then as they're standing there and he's telling them this, they see him go back up into heaven. And then Acts, uh, then they, the disciples, all the people who'd been watching, they go to the, a room, an upper room, because he told them to wait, wait for the gift of the Father. And they were worshiping and praying and, and waiting. They had no idea what they were waiting for. I mean, I didn't know. Maybe they thought Jesus is going to reappear to us. They didn't know what they were waiting. And then suddenly, suddenly there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. There were tongues of fire that, that landed on each of their heads. And it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in tongues in other languages. And it was so loud and such a commotion that people around said, what is this? What does this mean? These people are crazy. They must be drunk. And then Peter stands up and, and he talks about what this is. And on that day, 3,000 people said, yeah, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And they were born again and they were added into the community. So right then, that was the birth of the church. Now, they didn't go to a seminar on how do you do church. They couldn't go to a church down the road and go, now, how do you do this? And how do we do? There was no manual for how we do a church. So we're going to pick up the story on Acts 2.42, because I believe how God started his church has something for us today and what he wants us, the church, to look like. Acts 2.42-47 says all the believers, notice he says all, not some, all. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had and they worshiped together so they could give to those in need. They sold their property and possessions and shared money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, not just on Sundays, each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. They devoted themselves. That word devoted 
That's an action word. That's a verb. That's a moving word. It's not a going to a class one time or it's a one-time decision. It's a continual, steadfast, always devoting ourselves to three things. The apostles' teaching, they didn't have the, the written New Testament, the, the prayer and fellowship and breaking of bread and community. That's what we're gonna look at today because the result of that, I don't know about you, but I want the result of that. A deep sense of awe. There were miracles. They shared everything. They worshiped together. You know, no one was in need. And each day, they saw people coming and saying, I wanna be a follower of Jesus. Community isn't coming to this building and sitting in a seat and looking at the back of someone's head. That's not community. Community is relationship. We need another to be in community with. If we're by ourselves at the risk of stating the obvious, you and I can't be in community by ourselves. By myself, I am not a community. I've heard the early church in Acts referred to as a colony of heaven, heaven on earth. Jesus said before he was crucified, a new command I give you to love one another. Just as I have loved you, I want you to love one another so that the world will look at you and go, wow, they wear a really cool hoodie that has some saying, I know they're a Christian. Or they wear that, that uh, necklace that has a cross on it. Or they, they go to their church all the time, so they must be Christians. No, he said, they'll know by your love how you act in community, how you do this thing called church, how you love each other. First point is this, community is God's plan. In fact, without community, there is no church. See, in our Western world, we've, we've equated church with a building. It was never designed to be a, acquainted with a building, but to be about a community of people. If this building ceased to exist tomorrow, we would still be the church. Because the church is us. It's the, it's the relational community and you don't need a building to have a community. You don't need a building to be the church. We're the church because he calls us his church, his body. We are Christ's body. It's always been his plan. Because if we can gather and sing songs and come together and look at a message and we don't have relationship, we don't have community, then we've just gone to a, a really good pep rally. God has designed us to live and walk in community. In the very beginning, in Genesis, when God created the heavens and the earth, he um, created the sun, moon, and stars, and he said, it is good. He created the, the fish and the birds, and he said, it's good. He created vegetation, he said, it's good. He created all the animals, he says, it's good. He created man, and he said, it's not good. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. We were never designed to walk this journey by ourselves. And some of us are weary and we're tired and we feel like throwing in the towel because we've been trying to do it alone. And I believe God wants to arrest our attention today to say, enough of doing this alone. We need to do this in community with one another. It's not good for us to be alone. There's an African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. This past week, on February 22nd, on Thursday, our family celebrated an anniversary of sorts. Maybe not celebrated, maybe the word is remembered, recounted. It was the 24th year since the accident the car accident that my, our son, Danny, and my husband, Gary, was in that left him a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the armpits down and using a wheelchair temporarily. Temporarily. <laughs> if not here, then heaven, but we wait with expectant hope always. Some of you have been waiting and waiting and waiting. Don't faint. Don't give up. Don't quit. Because you never know what's around the corner. 
When the accident happened, our community, the people that we did life with, the people that surrounded us, the people that we did life with before the accident, they came and they surrounded us and they were there and they were present and they lifted us up. We had to, um, when the accident happened and we got the phone call, Anna and I, our daughter, were in the house. We walked out of our house that night. None of us ever returned to live another night in that home because it wasn't accessible. And so other people, when it was time, I had to buy a house while he was in the hospital and, and other people packed our stuff. Now, I don't know how you left your house this morning, but that's how I left mine. And other people came in to all my stuff and packed it in boxes. Somebody donated a, a moving truck. They, they moved it to the new house and then they unpacked it and put it away. Our community did that. 60 pastors in our community fasted and prayed for weeks, stood with us, believed with us because they were our community. There was a woman in my community when he was um, in the hospital and they had given me a little apartment near the hospital. It was about an hour from where we lived. And she would come at night. This just makes me tear up every single time. And she would sing over me so I could sleep. People in our community lifted us up. Every night during Gary was in rehab for three months, every single night, one of our staff pastors, they would take turns and they would drive the hour to the rehab hospital. They would spend the night. And then in the morning, they'd have time in the word and in prayer together before they drove back and spent a whole day in the office at the church. Our community, there were two women in my circle that we had to do rehab for, for a whole year, um, three times a week, and it was grueling. And once a week, they would come and clean my house and make me dinner, make us dinner. So when we come home after a long day, there was dinner. Who's in your community? Who are the people that, that you have relationship with that if there was a crisis, they would come along beside you? Did, did, you show the, did they show the pictures by any chance? of the accident. You can go ahead and put those pictures up of our family before. And uh, my husband in the hospital, he had just had surgery. Um, our family after. And then our family today. Amen. We have numerous other stories, too, much to, uh, too many to mention, but if you were to ask our daughter, Anna, and our son, Danny, they had the same community of people. So my question to you isn't, who are the people that are in your circle? But if someone was in a crisis, what gift do you have to offer? Because often we look at it and we think, well, who's going to help me? But on the other side of the coin, who are you going to help? Who do you need to be there? Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 says, two people are better than one for they can help each other succeed. And if one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. We need to be there to, for each other. Who's in your community? In Mark chapter two, Jesus tells the story, or no, the story is recorded of, of the man who was paralyzed and he was on a mat and his four friends carried his mat because they were gonna take him to Jesus and they couldn't get to him. So they put a hole in the roof and they lowered him down to get him to Jesus. Oh, we talk about the paralyzed man on the mat, but what about his friends? What if you're to be the friend when someone is at their lowest and they need help carrying their mat to Jesus? See, because it isn't just what we need. It's what do we have to offer? Community is both sides of the coin. God designed us to be in community. What if your story, and Josie, I, I love that you shared your story. What if your story is supposed to intersect with someone else's story? What if your story holds the answer to someone else's problem? We need each other. Church, we need each other. Second point is this, community is God's design for care and protection. Care and protection. Community is designed to sharpen us, encourage us, support us. Acts 2.45 says they sold their property and, and they took that money and they made sure no one was in need. Community is for our care and community is also God's design for our protection. Hebrews 10.25 said, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do but encourage one another. Now, we know encouragement is like, wow, you look really great today. I'm glad to see you. No, that word, that picture of encourage is come alongside. 
come alongside, shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm. We're going to come alongside and encourage and strengthen because God's design for our protection is community. In other words, I'm standing with you. You're not alone. You are not alone. You may feel alone, but you are not alone. I've had the incredible privilege of being part of a missions team or leading a team in Africa four different times. And one of the times we were there, we were out on the great Serengeti in an open air Jeep. And our our driver took us by a Cape Buffalo that had been taken down by a lion. You can show the picture of the Cape Buffalo. My husband took that picture, by the way. Isn't that amazing? They're huge. You can go to the next one. So this is the Cape Buffalo that was down. Cape Buffalo weigh like 1,900 pounds. A lion weighs a mere 400 pounds. Our guide told us how the lion took down that Cape Buffalo. He had wandered away from his herd. He had wandered away from his community. You can go to the next picture. This is the big full lion after eating part of the Cape Buffalo. (laughs) I know, you can, you can take it off the lion picture, right? <laughs> but hear this, friends. The enemy of your soul wants to isolate you and draw you away from your community because he knows if you're off by yourself and you're isolated, you're easy pickings because he's come to kill steal and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life to the full. In fact, Jesus said, if two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm there in the middle of it. There is protection in community. We need each other. We need each other. And the last point is this, community necessitates authenticity. In the verses that we read earlier in Acts chapter two, all the believers devoted themselves, I said, to three things, the apostles' teaching, to prayer, and to fellowship. Now, I don't know about you, but, but when I hear the word fellowship, I think of, oh, we hung out, we watched a, a show together, we watched a sports game, we had food. But that word fellowship actually means the intimate sharing of oneself to another. It's the picture of vulnerability. See, community flourishes with authenticity. There's no real community without genuine vulnerability. Let's be real. Most of us, when we came into this place today, we engaged in small talk. You know, the, hi, how are you? I'm good. How about you? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But for some of us, that's all we've got a Sunday meet and greet. When the church was started in Acts, I don't think that's the picture the Bible paints as a Sunday meet and greet. He wants us to be connected with one another in his body. Recently, I was uh, having lunch with a friend. We were having a great conversation and I decided to take the plunge to take off my mask and to say, I, I feel lonely. And you know, whenever you're vulnerable and honest and authentic, you have that moment of, oh my gosh, what have I just done? But in that moment, she looked back at me and she said, I'm lonely too. What if my vulnerability is the very thing that gave her freedom to share where she was at. See, our vulnerability, our authenticity is not just about us and our freedom. It's about someone else's freedom. It's about the other person's freedom. Because when I said, I'm lonely, it gave her permission to admit where she already was. When we're authentic, we give the people in our circle, the people in our community, permission to, you can be real, you can be authentic. You don't have to pretend, you don't have to put on. Our honesty paves the way for freedom. Most of us go to great lengths to hide our weakness. 
I mean, what's the most dreaded question on a job interview? What's your greatest weakness? My weakness is I care too much. I mean, you know, uh, what do you put for that? (laughs) We spend most of our lives trying to reinforce the picture that we're strong and that we have it together. Friends, we hold this treasure in earthen vessels and clay pots. You and I are just piles of dirt that he's breathed life into. Why are we so afraid to show weakness, to share our weakness? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul's explaining how he's had this thorn in the flesh, this weakness, this thing, this problem. And he's asked the Lord and starting in verse nine, he says, three different times I asked God, will you take away this weakness in me? And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now, Paul said, I'm going, to glad, I'm going to boast about my weakness. I'm going to tell other people about my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on me. That's why I take pleasure in it. The insults, the hardships, the persecutions, the weak parts in me, the troubles I suffer for Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. I like the strong part. The weak part, not so much. For the past 24 years, often I've had people come to me and say, oh, you're so strong. I go, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm a weak woman who serves a very strong God. But but when that happens, it's a signal to me that I've put up a wall, that I've covered up my weakness and not allowed someone to see it. When we put up walls and pretend, I'm good, I'm not struggling, I don't have a need, we're responding to the lie that says, you can't, you can't share that. What will they think of you? Never knowing that your very act of courage, of being honest and being vulnerable and being authentic may be the very thing that God wants to use for freedom, not only in your life, but in that other person's life. What if we began, all of us, to say, you know what? I'm gonna quit doing the I've got everything together kind of thing. And I'm gonna say, you know what? I'm struggling. She asked last week, those who felt lonely and depressed, that's me. Would you pray for me? What would happen if we all began to walk in that? Can you imagine what our community would look like that we would be real with one another, authentic, genuine with one another. We're his body. All of us are needed and necessary. And some of us have lived way too long behind a wall of hurt and of shame and of woundedness. They said, oh, I tried that before and, and someone stabbed me in the back. And so you have this perfect wall built. And we, we come into church after spending our, our time out there and we've been uh, carried all this garbage from the world. And we come in here and, oh, is my, is my wall perfect? Are all my holes covered? Okay, I'm good. I've got my wall up. And we come in here and our wall meets someone else's wall. And we're both left untouched and unaffected. What if, what if we began to take a brick out of our wall? What if we met someone we didn't already know and we took a brick out of our wall? What if we walked across the room from one side to the other and we took a brick out of our wall? What if we turned to the person next to us and said, can I pray for you? Will you pray for me? What if we joined a life group. Oh, I can't do that. I don't, that's scary. I don't know anybody. But what if we took a brick out of our wall? What if we took a brick out of our wall and said, you know what? I'm going to sign up for that discipleship class. Or I don't know anybody and I feel alone and isolated. What if we joined a serve team? What if we took a brick out of our wall and when service ended today, we didn't bolt for the door? I know, I see ya. (laughs) What if we actually stopped and had a conversation and met someone we didn't know? Well, I don't know what to say. How about you just ask a question? Hey, how long have you been coming? I've only been coming a short time. Tell me your story. I'll tell you mine. 
What if we had a conversation with someone who's different than us? We took a brick out of our, what if we actually, when someone asks us what they can pray for, we don't talk about our Aunt June, but we actually talk about something that's going on in our life. What if we said, you know what? I'm, I'm struggling. My marriage is struggling. I need prayer. I need help. I want God to do a miracle. What if I've got an addiction in my life? I have an addiction to pornography and I can't dare tell anybody. How could I say that? What if you're admitting to that is the very thing that would cause freedom in their life? They're like, you know what? I'm struggling with depression. I, it's hard for me to get out of bed. I'm struggling with an addiction of a different kind. What if we began to take the bricks out of our walls and be the community, be the body, be the church that God designed for us to be, that no one stands alone, that no one feels alone, that we stand together shoulder to shoulder and we've got each other's back. I've got you protected. And when we see somebody wandering off or we haven't seen them in a few weeks, instead of assuming, oh, you know, they're probably just busy, why not take a brick out of your wall and call? Say, you know what, I haven't seen you you doing okay? Why don't we have coffee? Why don't we have lunch? Can I pray for you? What can I pray for you about? We need each other. God designed us to be in community. So start today and take a brick out of your wall so that when we come in here, there's real relationship and it doesn't just happen on Sunday, but it happens on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Because in that verse where he says, encourage one another daily, he said, because the time is near to his return. Now, I know we're closer to his return than we were when that was written. How much more? Do we need to be an encouragement and a strength to each other? Would you bow your heads with me this morning before, before we close and, and go on to the, to the next thing? I just wanna give an opportunity. If you're in this place and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, maybe you come to church for a long time, but you have never said, Lord, I surrender to you. I wanna be a follower of you. I'm all yours. I acknowledge you. You died on the cross for my sins and you rose from the grave. And it's only through you that I can have right relationship with God. If you've never done that, if you've never wholly surrendered your life or, or maybe you did it one time, but you've wandered away, I'm not gonna call you out. I just want a chance to pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand all over this place? I want to surrender my whole life to Jesus. I wanna be a follower of His. I wanna to start today and live the way he wants me to live, to follow him. Amen. Amen. Will you pray this prayer after me? Dear God, I say it with me. Dear God, I surrender my life to you. I choose this day to follow after you with my whole heart with my whole life. Will you make me a brand new person on the inside? I choose to follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.